Hello and welcome to this virtual presentation of a talk I will be giving at the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness 17th annual meeting coming up here in San Diego. Um, I'm very excited uh, presenting this talk as part of a symposium that I organized um, on the role of the prefrontal cortex in conscious experience. Um, and I'm very excited to have organized this uh, symposium. You know, I've been involved with the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness since the um, since the uh, seventh annual meeting, which I think was held in um, Memphis, Tennessee, in uh, in 2003. And I've been a fairly regular attender uh, of these conferences. I've presented poster presentations and given talks. Um, I've missed a couple of them that have been abroad, but I have been. Um, in Belgium, for instance, and want to go to one. And so I, I'm very happy to see this conference thriving. I'm really looking forward to the 17th annual meeting in San Diego. Um, I think that we're uh, seeing a, um, currently a debate um, in the literature that's very exciting over the neural correlates of consciousness, over whether they are global um, and include um, areas outside of traditional sensory cortices, or whether they are narrow and uh, don't include uh, areas that are outside traditional sensory cortices. Um, and so what we're going to focus on in this symposium is what possible ro role the prefrontal cortex may have. Um, does it play a role in generating conscious experience or does it serve merely a reporting secondary afterwards kind of function? So the general idea I had in organizing this session was to get two philosophers um, and two neuroscientists to well-known, um, one from each camp, uh, two moderately not well-known, one from each camp. So roughly what we have is a philosopher-scientist pair for the um, uh, involvement of higher-order views and a philosopher-scientist pair against it. So we're going to start off with a talk by Rafi Malik, and he's going to present evidence that there's only local ignitions of neural activity uh, confined to sensory cortices and that these higher-order areas are um, associated with reporting and so forth. Then we'll hear from Joe Levine, who will present the philosophical case against um, uh, one particular version of higher order thought theories and argue that um, first order views philosophically get it better. So you have some empirical evidence and some philosophical evidence. Um, and that'll be followed by a talk by Dobi Ranev, who uh, got his PhD in Hakuan Lao's lab at Columbia and now is a postdoc at, at Berkeley. And he'll present evidence for some higher order uh, attentional effects on consciousness. And then finally, at the end of this, I'll go ahead and go and I'll suggest um, both for philosophical and empirical reasons that the higher order thought theory um, does a lot better than people have assumed. So having said that, let's go ahead and get started with our first talk which in this case will be me. <laughs> so I'm going to be giving um, a version of my paper uh, that I co-wrote with Ha Kwan Lao, Consciousness Without First Order Representations. This paper is not out yet, uh, but we finished it a couple years ago. And so um, we spent a lot of time working this stuff out, and the views I'm going to present today were really influenced by that discussion. And so while I'll own all the mistakes that I make today, I really do want to acknowledge that um, uh, this is uh, a jointly worked out kind of view, even though Hakwan and I probably don't agree on everything. So this is my version of that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, what I want to do today is, is present an argument that some kind of higher order theory of consciousness could be true. And by higher order theory of consciousness, I'm using the term kind of um, broadly to include any kind of view that, that provides a role for the prefrontal cortex to be involved in conscious experience. And in particular, I want to make the case that's the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's the thing that's interesting. That's the thing that we should be looking at. And I want to argue that we can interpret what's going on in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as instantiating a particular version of the traditional higher order thought theory or something that looks close enough like it. Okay, so in order to make this argument, I want to do three things in this talk. Um, the first, I want to talk about the prefrontal cortex and higher order theories and uh, focus in on the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. The second thing I want to do is uh, talk about lesion studies. You hear them cited as evidence against higher order theories, um, the frontal, prefrontal cortex being involved in conscious experience. I assume Rafi is going to be talking about this in his talk, so I want to address that. 
I think the upshot here is that there's not enough uh, careful attention being paid to these studies, and so they haven't been used in the right way so far. Um, and then finally, I want to look at what's going on in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and look at two different models uh, of that what might be going on there. One, sort of the higher order thought theory. The other, what we call the joint determination view, what I have sometimes called the split level view. Um, and I think each of these views have interesting things going for them, so I want to sort of compare them. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So higher order theories uh, comprise a diverse group of theories, but they're all committed to a basic idea, which is sometimes called the transitivity principle, um, because David Rosenthal's work. So this is the uh, way that I'll formulate this principle. It states that a conscious mental state consists in my being aware of myself as being in that state. So what it is for one to have a conscious mental state is for there to be this kind of higher suitable higher order awareness. And by conscious state here, I'll be meaning phenomenal consciousness um, in the sense of there being something that it's like for one to be in these states. Uh, another way to put the transitivity principle in the converse form is to say that it's uh, the case that a mental state that I'm in no way aware of myself as being in doesn't count as a conscious state. So you have these two claims. And now there are different ways to uh, implement the transitivity principle, but what makes a view higher order, one might argue, is that it's uh, in essence committed to this claim. Now, of course, right off the bat, you'll notice that uh, we formulated it in terms of one's being aware of oneself as being in a certain state, and so we might wonder what we mean by that. So here is a figure um, from Lau and Rosenthal's uh, 2011 Trends in Cognitive Science paper. And so what we have here are, um, in the back of the brain, uh, first order representations, which on the higher order view, you'll find in the sensory cortices. Uh, and so here, you know, motion perception in the uh, medial temporal areas. Uh, now, if you just have the motion perception, that's not going to be conscious according to the higher order view. You need a higher order awareness. Um, uh, something to the effect that I am seeing this motion, some kind of representation to the effect that one is in that first order state. And uh, the way that Aquan Lau and David Rosenthal and I interpret the higher order theory, this higher order thought is itself unconscious and will require a third order thought about it to make that higher order thought conscious. Though the theory is not committed to this, um, recent empirical work has made it... Uh, worth looking into the claim that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the important area that we need to talk about. And we should distinguish this way of thinking about the theory from the, a common misinterpretation of it, which is that the higher order thoughts have to be conscious or something like that. And so in Hakwan's other work, he suggested that this kind of self-directed introspection depends on um, medial frontal areas. And so you might think, ah, well, if you have deactivation in the prefrontal cortex, that's bad for the higher order thought theory, but it's not the case um, since you need to differentiate different areas in the prefrontal cortex, uh, and it would only be um, activity in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex that's something that we're interested in, and that's because we don't think of these things as consciously self-directed introspective thoughts, um, which is what you would get if it were these other areas of the prefrontal cortex. So we want to be clear that this isn't the way we interpret the view. And so a lot of the, um, uh, and so some of the evidence that is presented, like the Goldberg et al., which you know comes from Rafi's lab, um, where people are uh, it really involved in intensely involved in watching a video or something like that. They don't have these kind of activation in the medial frontal areas. That would not be an objection to the kind of higher order view that we're interested in, which takes the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as the important area. Now, of course, if this is your view, um, that a certain higher order awareness is, aware, is required and that the likely area um, is somewhere in the prefrontal cortex where you find this kind of awareness, then you get an immediate empirically testable prediction, which is that you should be able to have a difference in conscious experience without changing the first order activity. That's kind of a straightforward prediction of the higher order view. And what Hakwan and I have argued, and what David and Hakwan have argued as well, is that you can see the kind of results that come out of his lab as confirming this prediction. So take the Ronev results, what Doby was talking what we'll be talking about. Um, there, it, it, you can make the case that what you have uh, are subjects that are performance matched, they're equally good at telling whether um, that thing on the right hand side is a 
grating or just a noise pattern. Um, they're equally good at uh, pressing a button to discriminate between which is which, but you get difference in reports about how visible the thing is, and normally we would take that as evidence that they differ in their conscious experience. So given that their D primes are the same, you have a case that first order states are the same. Um, but you get different reports, so you have a case that they have different conscious experiences, and so first order states the same difference in conscious experience. When you look at what's going on in the brain, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex seems to be implicated. Now, of course, um, the objection is that these aren't generally perceptual effects, but are reflect a cognitive bias or some kind of reporting bias. And that's a possibility here, but um, they have done a lot of controls in these cases. And you would expect that if it were a cognitive bias, you could train it away. You could offer them money, training, or something like that, and get rid of it um, if you were careful enough. And they found that that could not be done. The effect is there no matter what you do and how, uh, no matter how many controls you implicate. Uh, implement. Now, that's not a knockdown argument, um, but it's a suggestive argument, and in normal circumstances, that would be enough to get, take, to take, get us to take the possibility that this is a perceptual uh, um, effect seriously. So it looks like it's only if you have a certain view about what consciousness is that you would go to these kinds of links to explain away um, these, these kinds of results. And interestingly, at this point, uh, it looks like views that rely on accessibility versus actual access have a problem with these kinds of results because um, higher order views predict that you'll see a, a divergence between performance on a task and what the conscious experience of the subject is because there's two components um, and you can vary them independently. Whereas accessibility views, uh, the state that's made globally accessible or, or whatnot um, is going to be driving task performance. And so global workspace theories, maybe Jesse Prince's air theories, um, these kinds of theories look like they have some kind of issue with these kinds of raw nev results. And so this, again, is just asking for more empirical um, engagement. What, what we need to see is all these kinds of theories of consciousness trying to explain these data. And, and to my knowledge, we haven't seen that yet. Okay, so given that, um, we have this kind of empirically based argument which suggests that the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is an interesting place to look, um, immediately you might think, okay, well look, you know, there's got to be something wrong with that because we know from the lesion data that um, getting rid of the prefrontal cortex doesn't impair conscious experience. And you find a lot of people citing this kind of stuff. Uh, but it seems to me that they haven't been doing it um, carefully enough. So the first thing that we need to do is ask ourselves, what would happen if you sort of uh, according to, if the higher order theory were true and the prefrontal cortex is a necessary component um, or identical to conscious experience, then what would happen if you removed it? Well, you would remove conscious experience, but you would have all the first order states there, and so you would preserve task performance. Um, and oftentimes, people sort of just assume that, look, you know, in the lesion study, people are still able to complete these visual tasks. So, therefore, their consciousness must be intact. But on the higher order view, that's question begging. Since we would predict in the most perfect case that they would have the perfect task performance, um, they would even be able to tell you about the stimulus um, if you ask them about it um, because all those first order states are there. Now, of course, if you ask them to report on their own experience, you would expect a diversion there. So you would expect the difference at the level of reports. Um, and often it, in the leisure studies, um, for instance, this is a, um, an argument that Benji Kozik makes in his forthcoming philosophical studies paper on this very topic. He says, look, you know, these people don't report any kind of unusual conscious experience. They don't say, oh, you know, my conscious experience is gone. Um, and it seems like, again, that's not taking the higher order view seriously because on that view you would expect uh, that they wouldn't notice. Um, they have all the same first order states and that you have a big chunk of your conscious experience missing. Um, it's not automatically clear that you would notice that. And so think about neglect, for instance. One um, way of thinking about what's going on there, although this, you know, if we can dispute this, one way of thinking about it is that they just have no conscious experience in the right visual hemisphere. 
Um, and yet they just don't notice it. It doesn't seem unusual. doesn't seem like something is missing. And so anecdotally, you know, we can, you, you don't seem to be missing the stuff from behind your head. Your visual field seems complete. And so again, if you're missing a part of it or if it's just gone, um, it's not obvious that you would spontaneously offer these reports. Now, if you ask them to report on their own conscious experience, you would expect them to say that they don't, uh, they don't um, see anything or that they, there's nothing that it's like for them to see it. And so you would expect um, a, a blind sight like uh, self-report. And in fact, that's exactly what you find. Um, and this is what Hakwan, a large part of what Hakwan and I's argument is, is that when you do the empirical data, you do find exactly this pattern. So when you TMS the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you get these divergence in reports, but task performance, performance stays the same. Um, now, what this shows, I think, is not that you can't falsify the higher order theory with lesion data, but it hasn't been used in the right way so far. So we just haven't been careful enough in the present presentation um, of the data and in actually probing the subjects. You haven't asked them. And so uh, now, of course, in a couple of cases, like for instance, where you have a bilateral ablation of the prefrontal cortex, you get something like a, what's called an akinetic mutism, where subjects just sit there, don't respond to stimuli. And of course, that is compatible with either view. So right now, the lesion um, uh, studies are a mess. We haven't asked the right kinds of questions of the right subjects. Uh, and we've sort of imported assumptions about where consciousness would be and what we would expect to find, um, which clearly beg the question against the higher order view. So I don't think lesion evidence should worry us at all. Now, given that in our earlier empirically suggestive evidence, we can turn to looking at the two different models of the higher order theory. So these would be uh, philosophical interpretations of what the activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is. So on the more traditional version of the higher order thought theory, what you have is something like a representation which describes or attributes to you a certain kind of property. Um, on the other view, which I'll call model two in this talk, what you have is a state which somehow says, describes you as being in a certain state, but doesn't actually describe the state you're in. It points to it, um, or gives the address of it. You might think of that as having a, a hyperlink. You, this state being underlined, you can click through to it and actually bring up the state or get go to the address and access it. But uh, so far, what you just have is an address, a direct kind of referential link between them. And so what I want to do is compare these two views. And here's a way of pictorially kind of metaphorically representing them. On the left-hand side, you have model one. Um, on the bottom, you have the unconscious... Uh, First order state, the representation of the external world property. You have the higher order awareness, which attributes to you being in that kind of first order state, but it describes in the content of the higher order state, blue star. And so that's why if, when you have this conscious experience and what we say is that it's like seeing blue for you, um, where that blue content is, is in the content of the higher order thought. Now on model two, that's not the case. Um, you say, I am in this state, you point to the state, but the blue content, the thing which provides or makes it the case that it's like blue for you, is not some content in the higher order state, it's the first order state itself. Okay, now um, both of these views are compatible with the raw nev case. And so um, you might say, well, what happens when the first order states are not there? Uh, or when you have a difference in conscious experience in the same first order states, right? How do you, what's going on there? Um, well, both cases are going to claim, both, both views are going to claim that there is some conscious experience going on. Uh, so on the model one, it might be that the conscious experience is the same as it is even when the first order state is there. Uh, if you have the higher awareness to the effect that you're in that kind of state, that's how it's going to appear to you, and that'll be true whether that state is there or not. Um, now, on model two, that's not going to be the case. Since if the first order state is there, then the blueness of the experience will be missing. But nonetheless, you'll have an experience to the effect that you're seeing something or other. And it may even be very specific, like I'm in this specific visual state. Um, but without the first order content there, then when you actually try to report or access the state, you'll, you'll get it wrong. And so this might be one way of explaining what's going on in the raw NF case. And it should be pointed out that 
the Model 1 is capable of this same kind of explanation. So it could be the case that you represent yourself as being in that particular state, or you could just have this kind of representation. I am in some visual state or other, or I am seeing this some specific shade of blue, uh, but without actually describing it, then you would get the same then you would get the same phenomenology on both model one and model two. Okay, so now what about coming from the other end, so to speak? Uh, what do the two views say about the first order state? Um, well, in the absence of the higher order awareness, both models claim that there's nothing that it's like for you to have these first order properties. Um, they just represent physical properties outside of you, maybe reflect, reflectance, surface reflectances, profiles or something like that. And that it's only when the higher order awareness comes that you get the conscious experience. Now, this, uh, I think, is where Model 1 fares better over Model 2. Because Model 1, if you ask the question, how do you explain that it's like seeing blue for you? The answer is that, well, that's the content of the higher order state. You describe your own experience mental life as having that property and that explains why it appears to you as though you're seeing blue as opposed to red um, and so this avoids Joe's worry one of the worries he's going to talk about in his talk to the effect that um, phenomenal characters seems to be the kind of thing essentially which when you have it it's conscious uh, and on model one you capture that intuition um, when the higher order state occurs that's what consciousness is on this model and that's always going to be phenomenally like the way the state uh, describes itself as being. Now, on Model 2, it doesn't seem like you get that kind of explanation. Um, why is it that when you point at the state, it's like seeing blue as opposed to red? Uh, why isn't it the case that when the state's not there, there's nothing? I mean, how does this work? How does this relationship of pointing or naming um, account for the blueness of my experience or the fact that... Uh, there is something that it's like for me. And how do you explain how this thing, which has it at one moment and does it at the next, the, the first order state, how do you explain how that thing um, can exist without it having this phenomenal character? So I think you get all of those problems there. Now, of course, some may hold this as a empirical problem, and you might just say, look, you know, um, explanatory power is one thing, and Model 1 perhaps has more explanatory power, uh, but Model 2 may turn out to fit the data. One reason you may think that is you may think, look, does the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex really have enough computational power to represent all of the different kinds of things which can occur in my conscious experience? Um, just take colors alone. Some people estimate we see a million colors. Um, so we have a million different color concepts. Um, and that's just for one modality, uh, sense, uh, one sense modality, vision, not to mention audition or olfaction. So some people may think it's just empirically implausible that you could have that kind of computational power in such a small area of the brain. And so this may be some reason to support model two, because if the content is given by the visual cortex, then there's a lot more possibilities there. Now, of course, this is where this debate brushes up against the phenomenological overflow debate, um, which is a debate about whether consciousness is sparse or extremely detailed. And so model two tries to uh, capture the intuition that the phenomenological overflow people have, that consciousness can be very detailed in this way, um, but in an empirically plausible way. But uh, model one, has an answer to this, which is to back to claim that consciousness is sparse and back off the claim that it's as detailed as it seems to us. Since, if for instance, what's going on there is you have these represent uh, relational representations, um, rather than saying I'm in this particular blue star state, you may describe the state in terms of its similarities and differences to other states. Um, I'm in a state that's more like blue than orange, and so maybe a very limited set of uh, primitive color concepts could account for all the kinds of conscious experiences we have, um, employing them in this relational kind of way. So uh, at this point, the issue boils down to a, a purely empirical one. And to, to decide between these two views, I think it's not enough to do this kind of, which one can explain this? Because you may just think, look, there's no explanation. Um, and so at that point, it's more empirical work. And so I'm happy to say that this is uh, something which we'll be looking for data on in the future. Okay, so then concluding all of this, 
I think that um, the dorsolateral prefrontal can cortex is a viable candidate for the home of consciousness. Uh, we have some empirical evidence which points it to being important. We have some philosophical reasoning which seems to suggest that um, it's uh, a good candidate and it hasn't been falsified by any kind of um, empirical evidence. Now, that, I, I'm not saying that it's true. I'm saying that there's a kind of case to be made for, for it being true and that it's a reasonable hypothesis for someone to investigate given the evidence that we currently have. Um, and further, I think that given that, uh, it's an empirical case question which of these two models is going to turn out to accurately capture what's going on in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so um, I think these are extremely interesting times that we live in because we're honing in on really empirically tractable questions which have important philosophical significance. Thank you very much.